Welcome to a deep dive into the world of Louisa May Alcott. Everything that I share in these video essays is based on studies made by Alcott schoolers. I know you can find all the links from the description. To explore the development of Joseph and Friedrich's romantic relationship in the book, I am going to use historian Karen Listra's studies on the 19th century romantic love and courtship as a comparison. There are three stages of 19th century courtship. Love comes by multitude of reasons. Shared looks enact a mutual transaction of interior lives. This leads to an identification of selves and mutual recognition of persons. Jo spends quite a long time in New York, about eight months. When she sees Friedrich for the first time, she is immediately attracted to him. When the parlor door opened and shut, and someone began to hum, can stood as lunt, like a big bumblebee. It was dreadfully improper, I know, but I couldn't resist the temptation, and lifting one end of the curtain before the glass door, I peeped in. Professor Bear was there, and while he arranged his books, I took a good look at him. A regular German, rather stout, with brown hairs tumbled all over his head, a bushy beard, good nose, the kindest eyes I ever saw, and a splendid big voice that does one's ears good after our sharp or slipshod American gabble. His clothes were rusty, his hands were large, and he hadn't a really handsome feature in his face, except his beautiful teeth, yet I liked him, for he had a fine head. His linen was very nice, and he looked like a gentleman. Based on Joe's first impression on Friedrich, she seems to be completely enthralled by him. This is what Little Woman fan Melody Ellison has to say about Friedrich's looks. I think part of why people act like Friedrich is not attractive is because of the well-known Louisa May Alcott quote about intentionally making a funny match for Joe. I wouldn't be at all surprised if she didn't quite mean that. Laurie was conventionally attractive. There are men in our current times that fall into the same category. Men like Jack Efron. For example, if you were to ask me what I think of Jack Efron, I'd tell you that he's handsome. But I am not personally attracted to him. Like Joe, I prefer my man bearded and a little stout, but most importantly, intelligent, hardworking and kind. I think folks who can't accept an older, less hot version of the professor fail to understand his and Joe's relationship. She respected him, and he her, and for her that was the ultimate sexiness. One of the biggest misconceptions about Little Woman is that Joe is only based on Louisa. Louisa wrote Joe to be an idealized version of herself, and there are elements in Joe that come from women who Louisa admired. Louisa's friend Elizabeth Powell was the true model for the 15-year-old Joe. Based on the letter exchange between Elizabeth and Louisa, Elizabeth wasn't too keen on the idea of marriage, which is understandable since she was only 16. Elizabeth did fall in love and married 10 years later, but it would seem that she continued being a model for Joe, first for Joe March and then for Joe Bear. In reality, 15-year-old Louisa was complete opposite. Louisa had a huge crush on her father's best friend, philosopher Waldo Emerson. Louisa wrote love letters, but she never sent them, and she used to sit under his window singing Mignon's song. Mignon's song is a song from Goethe's novel, Wilhelm Meister's Apprenticeship, which was one of Louisa's favorite books. Emerson was one of the many models for Friedrich. Main model was philosopher Henry Thoreau, who married at Louisa's lifelong affection. When Joe meets Friedrich, for the first time, he's singing Minion's song. Do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel Small Umbrella in the Rain to learn more about the history of Little Woman. All my viewers can get 20% discount on my web store with the code Little Woman. If you're interested from art, illustration or anthropology, you can check out my website at fairychamber.com. When Jo writes her letter home, she says that the letter is rather quote-unquote berry and that she is always interested from odd people. We can interpret this that Jo is fascinated by Friedrich's eccentricism and this is where Jo finds her kindred spirit because all of her life she has considered herself as odd and not fitting. One of the reasons why Jo's and Laurie's relationship can never be a relationship between equals is that Laurie was looking for a mother figure in Jo and Friedrich being older and more mature than Laurie is a paradox of that. I was in our parlor last evening and Mr. Bear came in with some newspapers for Mrs. Kirk. She wasn't there but Minnie, who is a little old woman, introduced me very prettily. This is Mama's friend Miss March. Yes, and she's jolly and we like her lots, added Kitty, who is an enfant terrible. We both bowed and then we laughed, for the prim introduction and the blunt addition were rather a comical contrast. Like their creator, Joe and Friedrich shared their love for children. 
Already in the first novel, Joe escaped the female society and ran out to play with boys. In New York, Joe is more interested from the doings of Friedrich's nephews, Franz and Emil, than her female charges, Kitty and Minnie. The more time Joe spends in New York, more attractive Friedrich becomes, both physically and intellectually. When spring arrives, she makes notice on the pleasant curves about his mouth, his eyes that were never cold or hard, his big hands that had a warm, strong grasp that was more expressive than words. Already in the first part of Little Woman, we find out that Joe doesn't always enjoy the higher class social gatherings. Now that she's in the circles of writers, poets and intellectuals, which is the world where she longs to be part of, she's disappointed by her own illusions that she has created about that world. Before the evening was half over, Jo felt so disillusioned that she sat down in a corner to recover herself. Mr. Bear soon joined her, looking rather out of his element, and presently several of the philosophers, each mounted on his hobby, came ambling up to hold an intellectual tournament in the recess. Friedrich also seems to feel as he is in a wrong place. Jo becomes distressed when she is following the debate, and one of the young philosophers puts intellect above God. After some hesitation, Friedrich keeps his speech defending religion. The speech leaves an everlasting impression on Jo, and I would even argue that this is when Jo starts to realize that her feelings for Friedrich are more than friendship. She began to see that the character is a better possession than money, rank, intellect or beauty, and to feel that greatness is what a wise man has defined it to be, truth, reverence and goodwill, then her friend Friedrich Bär was not only good, but great. Little Woman is a Bildungsroman. Bildungsroman is a literary genre that originates from Germany. In its translation could be a coming-of-age novel. The focus of a Bildungsroman is in the moral and psychological development of the characters. In movies and in all TV adaptations so far, scene where Fritz expresses his opinions about sensational literature has been turned into a conflict. I guess it is supposed to create more drama, but this is not the way things go in the book because Jo already has labeled her sensational writings as rubbish way before she even thinks of traveling to New York. She has assured herself that her intentions are good because she would use the money to help her family. This inner conflict that Jo has begins in chapter 27, Literary Lessons. In this chapter, Jo attends to a lecture about pyramids. There she bumps into a young man who is reading a trading story written by Mrs. Northbury. Jo is amused by boys' admiration of the trash. That is how Jo calls this type of literature, which emphasizes her wish to disdain herself from those stories. So Jo's negative views towards sensational stories is clearly identified. When Jo hears how much Mrs. Northbury makes with her stress and thunder tales, Jo begins to change her mind and soon starts to write them herself. Stress and thunder tales originate from Goethe. In German, this genre is called Sturm und Drang. It sounds way more cooler in German. Drang refers into deep emotional stress. Sturm und Drang was a movement in literature and music in the late 18th century Germany and was largely influenced by Goethe's writings and plays. There is a great emphasis on the fate for the individual and the movement was highly influenced by Shakespeare. Goethe's Sturm und Drang plays were about very masculine teutonic heroes which is probably what fascinated Louisa as an author. Jo's first stories are poor attempts to capture the spirit of Sturm und Drang. Her story was full of desperation and despair as her limited acquaintance with those uncomfortable emotions enabled her to make it. Jo takes in consideration all the advice she gets from everyone around her, instead of seeking advice from someone who could help her to improve as a writer. She goes against her own judgment when she knows that some of the advice she receives does not improve the story. So with Spartan firmness, the young author has laid her first pawn on the table and chopped it up as ruthlessly as any ogre. In the hope of pleasing everyone, she took everyone's advice, and like the old man and his donkey in the fable, it suited nobody. After submitting to Punch of Magazine, Scene, jo writes her first novel, which is a romance, and it receives mixed reviews. Jo appreciates the feedback and learns from it. Her family and friends administered comfort and commendation liberally. Yet it was a hard time for sensitive, high-spirited Jo, who meant so well and had apparently done so ill. But it did her good, for those whose opinions had real value gave her the criticism which is an author's best education, and when the first soreness was over, she could laugh at the poor little book, yet believe in it still, and feel herself the wiser and stronger 
for the buffeting she had received. In chapter 34, when Jo enters to the publishing world in New York, she enters to the world that is male-dominated. Her sensational story is cut from third of its original length. Jo is frustrated the way Mr. Dashwood wants to cut out all the morals away from the story, and the morals are what Jo wishes to keep. Eventually, Jo agrees to these alternations to be made. Despite of her masculine shield, Jo is quite emotional internally, even though she doesn't like to show it, and writing dream tales becomes distressing. She was living in a bad society, and imaginary though it was, its influence affected her, for she was feeding heart and fancy on dangerous and unsubstantial food, and was fast brushing the innocent bloom from her nature by a premature acquaintance with the darker side of life, which comes soon enough to all of us. But Jo is ashamed of her writings. She is adamant about using a pseudonym, and she doesn't tell anyone at home what she is doing, and neither she has showed her stories to Fritz. Friedrich never criticizes Jo as a writer. He is criticizing the genre. Friedrich is honest. He wants Jo to take herself seriously as a writer. The book Jo does not shout or argue with Fritz, unlike the movie Jo does, because Friedrich expresses what Jo has been thinking all along. As a result, Jo burns her trashy novels. Then the book Jo tries to write for children, it doesn't feel right. Then she writes stories that only have moralities, that doesn't feel right either. She jumps from one literal genre to another, experimenting. Friedrich does turn out to be a friend. He encourages Jo to study real life people, so she can develop her characters. And as a Christmas gift, he gives her a set of Shakespeare's novels. Goethe, Louis's idol, would have had similar thoughts towards sensational stories that Friedrich had. Here's a quote from Megan Armknet, who has done some extensive research between Friedrich's character and Goethe. Bear is trying to help Jo become a genuine writer instead of one who catered to the whims of the crowd. This is something Goethe would have done. He disliked superficiality in people and in art, and was through life frequently offended by the shallow pretensions, the false aims, of writers who, because they have some poetic sensibility and some gift of expression. Louis accredited Goethe being the one author who has taught me the most about creating and understanding characters. In the 1994 film, Jo argues with Friedrich about her writings. The film kind of portrays Jo as an ultra-feminist, when Jo says, too bad her writings are not good enough for Friedrich's high morals. This is the complete opposite to the book Jo, because the book Jo and Friedrich, they have always shared the same morals. Here is a quote from a person who joined the Bear after becoming acquaintance with Friedrich for the first time through Reda Gerwig's film, and they got inspired to read the book. Never read or watched Little Woman before this, but I am so phenomenally fond of Friedrich, just in general. But this is coming from someone who watched the 2019 first and had no context prior to this. As a writer, cinema savvy person, I was made aware of Gerwig's cinematic parallelism of past and present during my watch, and I could tell that there must have been something taken out of the equ equation as a means to balance out Gervik's vision. Yet I took fondly of the man who was basically void of existence mid-movie, purely on the fact that Gervik's method of narrative essentialism still had me appreciate his weight. In the same way 2019 Jo summarized the entirety of her loneliness in a single sweep. As I later found out, she dedicated an entire chapter to such somber chills. I found that Friedrich's clean sweep came down to lines that could be easily overlooked if one came for acting instead of script. But do you have anyone to take you seriously, to talk about your work? He was essentially the one meant to simply see her. That in a single line Greta Gerwig had essentialized his character. This correlates with the book Fritz. Now Mr. Bear was a different man and slow to offer his opinions, not because they were unsettled, too sincere and earnest to be lightly spoken, as he glanced from Joe to several other young people, attracted by the brilliancy of the philosophic pyrotechnics, he knit his brows and longed to speak, fearing that some inflammable young soul would be led astray by the rockets, to find when the display was over. Of course, as I actually admitted, 2019 Friedrich was my first version of Friedrich, and he still managed to catch my attention for all he was worth. It was nice reading book 2 and finding out that Alcott wrote him as a worthy addition rather than a cop-out, as I've had the misfortune to read criticism as of late, that I was shocked at all that anyone would argue otherwise. <laughs>
This makes me wonder why Greta Gerwig had spent so much time and energy bashing the book Friedrich while promoting her film. With just that simple line he is established as someone worthy of Joe's love. Gerwig's film has its focus on how much Joe has discomforts with change, and the feedback scene doesn't promote the ultra feminism, but Joe comes out as more childish. She yells, she never speaks to him again, and it is not something that the book Joe would do. In the BBS series, Friedrich actually yells at Joe. That is not something that the book Friedrich does. Friedrich wasn't biased to Joe when it came to his feelings. He knew she could do more and wanted her to be as good writer as she can be, as she wanted to be. He sees her as an equal as a woman with true heart and soul, a woman with talent. He isn't easy on her, but neither is he cruel to her when it comes to her writing. I think ultimately she appreciated that Friedrich never softened the blow, but always treated her as someone whose ideas and thoughts were meant to be listened to. Here's another quote from chapter 27, Literally Lessons. That's just it. I've been fussing over the thing so long, I really don't know whether it's good or bad or indifferent. It will be a great help to have a cool impartial person take a look at it and tell me what they think of it. The whole chapter is about how Jo learns to define her craft from the feedback she receives way before she meets Friedrich and it foreshadows the arrival of Friedrich's character. There is a longing to find a person who cannot only give her constructive criticism but also encourage her to explore her capacity as a storyteller. The 2018 film did pretty good job with this by making Friedrich Cho's editor and a professor of literature. And so far it is the only film where Cho listens and embraces the feedback she receives same way as the book Cho does. When I was doing this research, I actually came appalled when I realized that the scene in Little Woman where Cho is having a mental breakdown because of the stories that she has to write for Weekly Volcano, that is never in the films. Louisa was in her early 20s. She wrote to a New York newspaper called Frank Leslie's Weekly Illustrated Newspaper. Weekly Volcano is a caricature of that newspaper. We tend to have quite one-dimensional way of thinking when it comes to historical people, because historical people had morals, just like we have morals. Louisa was writing for money, and writing for money, it came with mental health problems. She had to look up things that made her feel uncomfortable. They had stories about men abusing women, and some of the stories were racist and sexist. These things contradicted with Louisa and her own morals, which is why she quit. There's a literal quote in Louisa's journal where she writes about these moral struggles, and her friend Emerson says, Hey, you don't need to write anything you don't want to write. And just like Joe in the book, Louisa feels relief when she stops. You can find this journal online. You can read it for free. All these scriptwriters, they have had access to read it over a decade. There has been lots of unnecessary stereotyping made towards Friedrich's character. I will point out some of them partly because they are truly ridiculous, but also because they show how long a journey we have to understand Louisa May Alcott's worldview. In one supposedly feminist study that I read, the author pointed out that Friedrich having Shakespeare, Milton, Plato and Homer in addition to his German Bible in his bookshelf represent the way Joe is now captive of the male power. Apparently if a fictional male character who happens to be a teacher of philosophy has books about philosophy in his bookshelf, that must make him a sexist. Louisa herself grew up reading books and teachings of these particular philosophers. Plato was actually one of the first philosophers who talked about gender equality. Christine Doyle points out that throughout the book series, Friedrich's character represents the positive aspects of the German culture that the new immigrants embodied. Well read and well educated, Friedrich's shelf contains volumes of Shakespeare, Milton, Plato and Homer in addition to his German Bible. He is nevertheless remarkably unpretentious, darning his own socks for example. He is deeply religious, standing up for the importance of religion at the gathering of intellectuals he and Joe attend. This is a particularly important detail since unlike the working class German immigrants, German intellects were highly suspect for their godlessness. And it is actually against proponents of Kant's and Hegel's intellectualism that Friedrich launches his defense of religion. Even the great supporters of German literature, transcendentalists, sometimes found it difficult to come to terms with what they read as immorality. And even atheism 
When Laurie starts to make his moose on Joe, the book Joe feels very uncomfortable by that. She says no many times, but he doesn't listen or respect her. In the book, Joe is way more mature character than Laurie is, but in the recent adaptations, this is not the case. In Greta Gerwig's film, after Joe has nearly confessed to Marmy that she is in love with Friedrich, the film Joe suddenly decides to write Laurie and accept his proposal. This does not happen in the book. One might argue that the open ending is a cop-out not to handle Joe's loneliness and maximize the profits of the film by trying to please everyone. When Laurie proposes to Joe, he, he says he wants Joe to take care of him and he doesn't want Joe to continue writing. When Laurie's behavior becomes possessive, it is now that Joe finally realizes what it feels like for a woman when someone does not respect your boundaries. Laurie guilt trips Joe for a very long time and he makes fun of Friedrich even when he has never met him. This is a common narrative in Louisa May Alcott's novels. In Rose in Bloom, Charlie wishes to marry Rose because of her money. He's a lot like Laurie, a champ who everyone likes, but he's also very sensitive and escapes himself gambling and alcohol. Rose eventually falls for Mac, who is basically a younger Scottish-American version of Friedrich. In a work, Story of Experience, the protagonist Christy is courted by a man called Fletcher, a wealthy man who would like to own her, and Christy feels very uncomfortable by his obsessive behavior. There was no Me Too campaigns in the 19th century, so in true Alcottian style, these men are all forgiven. Laurie goes through a pro Process in which Amy plays an important part and thanks to her low BS level, Laurie actually improves himself. Fletcher and Charlie are not so lucky and in their deathbeds, they apologize to the protagonists. Laurie was never in love with Cho. He was looking for an excuse to keep their relationship as it was so that he would not have to grow or to take responsibility of his actions. But Cho wants to leave that toxic cycle they are in, especially after she has returned from New York and opened her heart for Frederick. I'm going to read you a quote from my friend Shelley, and Shelley knows Louisa May Alcott's books like her own pockets. In my opinion, Louisa May Alcott draws a lot of deliberate similarities between characters like Laurie, Charlie in Eight Cousins and Rose in Bloom, Tom in An Old Fashioned Girl, Jack in Jack and Jill, and Tony in Under the Lilacs, all of whom are raised in relatively comfortable settings, are kind-hearted and clever and talented, but more than a little wild and indolent and are influenced, whether for good or evil, most heavily by women. In Laurie's case, the marchers are explicitly referred to as a positive influence over him, but it's Marmy, Joe and Amy who ultimately hold the most sway, and each of their relationships with him represent some version of semi-domesticated feminine power, mother, sister, the lover. Despite the stated importance of the first two influences, however, Laurie isn't really inspired to better himself simply for the sake of being a better person growing up until he talks to Amy, who instead of muttering him or sparing his feelings, speaks to him honestly and tells him he needs to grow up. In Rose in Bloom, Rose's primary issue with Charlie is that Charlie is expecting her, the woman, to be the angel who saves him from himself keeps him from harm and he repeatedly wounds Rose by exploiting her natural kind heart and desire to help. Louisa could have gone down that same route with Nat and Daisy, Tommy and Nan and even Joe and Laurie or Laurie and Amy, but in all those other cases she writes a story where a woman requests to be afforded the same respect they want and they expect that from their life partners and the men either shape up and meet them on equal footing or miss out. Then there is the Friedrich archetype, that is Mac in Rose in Bloom, Friedrich in Little Woman, John in Hospital Sketches, Adam in Mood, David in Work. The Friedrich archetype, he is usually older and more calm, self-reliant and more grounded than the Laurie archetype. There is silent passion for the protagonist, desire to be on the equal ground with them. The idea that love beautifies a person and that when you are in a relationship with the right person, you inspire each other to be better. This is a really common theme in Louisa May Alcott's novels. In Friedrich's case, he wants to be worthy of Joe. He applies for a job in the West so he can provide both for Joe and his nephews. In the sequels, you can very clearly see how well Joe and Fritz perfectly balance each other's. The Friedrich archetype is mainly based on Henry Tarot. He was the great love of Louis' life. There was a very strong friendship between them. With Louis and Henry, there was almost a telepathic understanding between one another. 
Here's another quote from Cherry. The love story of Mac and Rose in Rose in Bloom is one of the most romantic ones in all of Louisa May Alcott novels, and a lot of that hinges on that telepathic form of communication. It's letters that sort of opens the window of their souls to each other and they connect on an intellectual level that to them deepens the love. Silent passion is a good way to describe it. I think the idea of Louisa May Alcott modeling her heroine's love interest after a man she admired in real life is almost tragically funny, because while she's writing something and thinking, and here's the happy ending, our beloved protagonist learns life lessons and finds love and future happiness with the mate who is worthy and equal to her, a large portion of her readership is going Quote unquote, she married that guy. Why? Because they are having trouble looking past the outward appearance. And unfortunately, I think a lot of people nowadays still miss her main point because they get so hung up on who didn't end up together that they fail to see why the people who did end up together are right for each other and how that marriage based on love and trust and respect and similar goals is so radical for a time that emphasized financial stability and or upward mobility over personal happiness. The fact that Louisa Mayall was in love with Henry Thoreau and that she had a fling with young Wisniewski this is common knowledge. You can read about it from pretty much every single Louisa May Alcott biography and from online as well. For example, Alcott schooler Susan Bailey, who runs Louisa May Alcott is my passion blog, she has written tons of information, fact-based articles on Louisa's relationship with this man. But I'm going to read you a quote from Marlowe Daily Gallion. Alcott shows women finding their own empowerment and satisfaction through their writing, through their art, through their relationships with others, the way they structure domestic activities, even in the way they are thinking about marriage as a partnership. Also, Alcott anticipates discussion of women's pleasure and fulfillment. When I teach a little woman, I like to ask my students if they enjoyed the sex scene. This is a subtle but important scene of intimacy and pleasure. After Meg and John have a discussion about finances, Alcott carefully includes a moment where Meg puts on John's coat, the coat that he is only able to buy because she returns the dress and they have enough money. She puts on the coat, welcomes him home, kinda racy. We might have missed it, but it comes next is a blissful state of things. So she, Louisa, is engaging with the ideas of pleasure. Again, I think a nice thing to remember that in 1868 and 1869, Louisa May Alcott is thinking about this. Louisa May Alcott was a transcendentalist. Transcendentalism was an American philosophical and Christian movement. Transcendentalism was based on the ideas of German philosopher Immanuel Kant and his ideology about the universal family, belief that all nations can learn from one another. Transcendentalists, they took this message to their hearts. If you know anything about the 19th century world events and conflicts, the transcendentalists were seen radical, but they were also ahead of their time. Getting familiar with other cultures was encouraged. The German immigrants were widely discriminated. Transcendentalists welcomed them. The most respected and valued literature and poetry and plays and art all came from Germany. And Louis's whole worldview was based on German philosophy. The 2019 film has been criticized for not including transcendentalist ideas. And when Greta Gerwig was promoting her film, she made tons of xenophobic statements about Friedrich's character, him being German, and him speaking with a German accent, and how Greta Gerwig thought it was repulsive. All these xenophobic comments, they don't align with Lewis's philosophy about the transnational family. And Greta Gerwig is a descendant of German immigrants herself. Some of the criticism what I have come across about Greta Gerwig is that she's reluctant to have minorities represented in her films, which is very unfortunate. When Joe decides to stop writing to the weekly volcano, she makes a remarkable realization. As a creator, everything that she writes to her novels has either a good or a bad influence to her readership, and she stops to think how much damage she has done by writing stories that conflicted with her own morals. She's not even paid well for those stories. Really, he represents the older Louisa and her whole transcendentalist worldview. He reminds Jo who she is as a person and that she has a good heart. Jo grew up in a family that was always ready to help those in need. Her mother took Jo and her sisters with them when she went to help the immigrant families 
and her father lost his job when he took a black child to his school. The Alcots were abolitionist and even hid black slaves at their home. Louise had first-hand witnessed people being discriminated because of their ethnicity. Gerwig also complained about Friedrich's looks, and this is the one thing that most people miss in Little Woman. Catherine Hepburn and Paul Lucas from the 1933 film probably are closest to what the characters are written to look like. The point of the story is that love beautifies a person. Joy is not written to be beautiful, but she finds Friedrich very attractive and he is attracted to her. Louisa was not particularly beautiful either. Even her fans were disappointed when they saw her. There's a hilarious scene in Joe's voice. There's this adult fan who comes to meet Joe Bear. Joe's in Friedrich's son. He points out the portrait of his mother and, and this fan is like, Oh no, I expected her to be 15 and pretty and have big tails. I don't think I want to see her now because she looks so mundane. Laurie is written to be a conventionally good looking character, but his actions over Joe are ugly. Films are sold with beautiful people, but I would be more worried about the way the filmmakers gloss over Laurie's flaws. Because of her look, sometimes Jo feels herself as a freak and that she's not worthy of love. Friedrich basically tells Jo that it is okay to be clumsy and unconventional and still be worthy of loving. Louisa met Ladislas Lady Wisniewski in Switzerland when she was working as a companion for an invalid woman called Anna Welt. Lady was a 21 year old composer from Poland. He was very charming and he called Louisa his little mama. He had tuberculosis and Louisa nursed him. Louisa was a trained nurse. He was flirting with Louisa. Something happened between Ladislas and Miss Welt. They got into an argument. Some people believe that he tried to force her to sleep with him and others say that he proposed her. There is an Alcott story called Anna Swim. It has a character who sounds just like Ladislas and he proposes a rich heiress called Anna. So maybe proposal idea is not so far-fetched. This is what Louisa writes. Anna troubled about Laddie, who was in a despairing state of mind. I could not advise them to be happy as they desired, so everything went wrong and both worried. Previous diary markings suggest that Laddie has been flirtatious with Louisa and had even mentioned possible future together. Louisa had written that Anna Weld was whiny, needy, foolish and didn't have a clue about Goethe. The tone of Louisa's diary markings change. She begins to sympathize Anna and becomes more suspicious about Laddie. When Louisa writes, could not advise them to be happy as they desired. What does she mean? Did Laddie's lass and Anna had suddenly become affectionate with one another? It is very unlikely because quite soon Laddie's lass announced that he was leaving. Imagine being Louisa. First this handsome young guy is flirting with you all the time and being romantic and then he proposes your boss. Louisa was not rich at the time. She was not considered particularly beautiful and Louisa was about 32 when this happened. When her employment ended, she went to Paris and spent a day with him without a chaperone, which was very scandalous. And after that she wrote her very censored journals, words couldn't be. If you guys have read A Little Woman 2019 film guide, Greta Gerwig writes, Joe and Laurie could be a great couple if they would like to be. Well, it does seem that Louisa did not want it. This reminds me what Emily said in our Laurie podcast. When Laurie was proposing Joe, he was looking for someone to nanny him. Alcott biographer Harriet Weisen points out that perhaps Ladislas was a conman who preyed on wealthy women. There are things that suggest that Wisniewski might have been a con man. Louisa writes in her journals about his miraculous recovery from tuberculosis. Tuberculosis killed millions of people and very conveniently Ladislas is miraculously healed just before he has this conflict with Miss Weld. I don't know if he was a con man or not. I do believe that he might have mistaken Louis's care for him as something romantic and that he did want her to nanny him, which is not something that you can build a healthy relationship on. And I am pretty convinced that he was not on Louis's intellectual level and she could not rely him on being supportive on her writing. Susan Cheer writes in American Blue that every time when the Alcots moved back to Concord, Louisa would find herself 
loving Henry more and more every time when they returned. Louisa loved very masculine men. She writes in her journals that she loves soldiers and uniforms. She writes in her journals that Henry is the perfect man. And there's a quote where she compares Henry to Napoleon and her friend Emerson to Goethe. In Little Woman, Friedrich is Joe's sexual awakening. He's written to be more masculine and mature than Laurie. He has a beard, big hands, a deep voice. In Little Man, narrator even says that Joe loves very manly men. And there is some criticism over guys who are thin and more effeminate, like Laurie and Nat. In Joe's boys, there's actually quite many scenes where Joe and Frederick are kissing, and there's also a scene where they are making out. They are about to do the dirty, and their sons come in and stop them. I'm actually surprised that Louisa got away with that. It's pretty fair to say that Louisa wanted someone on her side who could feed her and stimulate her brain. Henry wasn't a great looker, but there was something about him because he had quite a few female admirers in Concord. Louisa was attracted to him, but most important aspect of that relationship was their similar interest and the intellectual connection that they had. And they did spend a lot of one-on-one -on -one time together. She would visit him at his hut in the Walden's Pond, they took long nature walks, and he would often take her to boat trips. I have said this before and I say it again, the age difference between them was the same as between Joe and Frederick. 16 years. Henry passed away when Louisa was 27. The rest of her life with Ladislas and other men and women who she encountered, she never found any of them being even remotely as intellectually stimulating as Henry was. In Little Woman, Joe confesses to Frederick that he is her first love and therefore the best. Something I found very interesting in my thorough research was that Henry and the whole Tarot family, they had a reputation that they despised gossip and supported individualism. This is something that Louisa admired. You can read from their journals that both Henry and Louisa often felt themselves as outsiders. Very similar to Joe and Frederick who are connected by their feelings of outsiderness. The self-censoring, it happens even in Little Woman. This raises the question, what is the intention of the author in the book when Amy burns Joe's manuscript? It happens because Joe has been bullying Amy for weeks and she's had enough. Little Woman is framed against Bill Prince process, a story where the protagonist learns to overcome their biggest flaws. For Joe, her biggest flaw is her temper. Why would Louisa make her literal counterpart to face that if there was no intention? She is the creator and the one who controls the story. Another explanation is that Louisa is censoring her own writing. Because when Joe writes the story again, it becomes a lot better. Second self-censoring happens with Weekly Volcano. As I explained earlier, Louisa used herself as an example, but never admitted that. In the last Little Woman book, Joe's Boys, when Joe has become a famous writer, She's very much against her nephew Demi, is writing stories for a magazine. Joe does not approve of it. Almost like Louisa is echoing her own history with sensationalism. Louisa began to self-censor her diaries when Little Woman became a bestseller. As a writer, she was marketed as the friend of all children. It is also important to point out that in the 19th century, sex was a taboo. There were times when Louisa struggled with the children book format because she preferred to write about the adult themes. Especially after Louisa's passing, the early Algot schoolers took everything that she had written literally. Most of these people were completely unaware that Louisa had self-censored her own journals. Not only Louisa wrote about her love life in Little Woman in Literal Disguise, she also wrote about her experience writing the sensational stories. We might even say that she wrote her biggest secrets to the novel. It is no wonder that she had very conflicted feelings about it. Some of us might be very eager to judge her for this, the way she tried to detach herself away from Little Woman. But in the 19th century, women having a good reputation, that was a lot more valuable than all the money that they owe. There is something that I would like to talk about. It's the hardcore of studying Little Woman from the perspective of gender. That is the idealization of the masculine. In one of her journal markings, Louisa has written, I am a hero worshipper by nature. If I quote one of my blog readers, Jo was drowning into internalized misogyny. Jo puts Laurie to a pedestal because Laurie is a boy. Laurie does the same to Jo because she is the first person who pays any attention to him. When Laurie is catfishing Meg, Jo doesn't see any problem in his behavior. And it is actually Laurie who Jo feels bad for. And this has made lots of modern readers, female readers especially, 
quite upset. What we know about Louisa was that she always preferred the male company rather than woman. Friedrich is idealized for a complete different reasons than Laurie. He is idealized because Joe is in love with him. When we get into the courting and the umbrella chapter, the roles are reversed between Joe and Friedrich and it is now Friedrich who openly admires Joe. Friedrich's model of masculinity is different. He respects her boundaries and does not overstep them, and only makes his moves on Joe when he has Joe's full consent. When Friedrich proposes to Joe, he gives her a German title, Professorin, which does not mean Professor's little wife like it was translated into my older Finnish translation of little woman. It is German and means a female professor. And by doing that, Friedrich acknowledges Joe's thirst for knowledge and considers her as his intellectual equal. In both 1994 film and 2019 film, Joe and Friedrich part in bad terms, but in the book they part as friends, both wondering if it could lead into something more in the future. Early as it was, he was at the station next morning to see Joe off, and thanks to him, she began her solitary journey with the pleasant memory of a familiar face smiling its farewell. A bunch of violets to keep her company, and best of all, the happy thought, well the winter's gone and I've written no books, earned no fortune, but I've made a friend worth having and I try to keep him all my life. John Fritz spent the next two years writing letters to each other. Taking care of Beth forces Jo to re-evaluate her life. After Beth's passing, she goes through a period of depression, grief and loneliness. In the book right after Beth's death, Laurie sends Jo a letter from Europe and proposes her again. This happens the moment Laurie has realized he has feelings for Amy. Jo sends him a polite answer and refuses again. Laurie's second proposal has never been adapted. In the book, shared looks continue when Friedrich comes courting. So a very social man, I think Mr. Bear would have gone decorously away and come again another day. But how could he, when Jo shut the door behind him and bereft him of his hat? Perhaps her face had something to do with it, or she forgot to hide her joy at seeing him and showed it with a frankness that proved irresistible to the solitary man, whose welcome far exceeded his boldest hopes. A steady glance now and then refreshed her like sips of fresh water after a dusty walk, for the sidelong peep showed her propitious omens. Mr. Bear's face had lost the absent-minded expression and looked all alive with interest in the present moment. Actually young and handsome, she thought. Shared looks were a big part of courting, and Joe comes to the realization that Fritz has truly come to court her, Joe flushes. She becomes fully self-aware, and she is quite pleased and thrilled by the idea. Then we get to the third and the most important part of the 19th century courtship, identification of selves, mutual recognition of one another, which in Little Woman is the umbrella. Courting is usually rushed in the films. Friedrich, in fact, visits the marches for two weeks, and during all this time he is hoping to see signs of love from Joe. For a fortnight, the professor came and went with lover-like regularity, then he stayed away for three whole days and made no sign a proceeding which caused everybody to look sober, and Joe to become pensive at first, and then, alas for romance, very cross. The idea of possibly losing Friedrich has become petrifying. She goes to the German quarter to look for him, but he is now to be found. It starts to rain and Joe is ready to burst into tears and then he's there. I feel to know the strong-minded lady who goes so bravely under many horse noses and so fast through much muss. What do you do down here, my friend? I'm shopping. Mr. Bear smiled as he glanced from the pickle factory on one side to the wholesale hide and leather concern on the other, but to her he only said politely, you have no umbrella. May I go also and take for you the bundles? Yes, thank you. Joe's cheek were as red as a rib and she wondered what he thought of her, but she didn't care, for in a minute she found herself walking away arm in arm with her professor, feeling as if the sun had suddenly burst out with uncommon brilliancy, that the world was all right again, and that one truly happy woman was passed through the wet that day. Jo doesn't have lots of experiences with men, so it makes sense that she is quite clumsy and awkward around him. In an earlier version of the script of Greta Gerwig's film, Jo actually pulled down a chair when Fritz came to visit, and he fixed it in a very calm manner. At least they included the part of Jo setting herself on fire and the viewer finds out that Friedrich is just as clumsy. We thought you had gone, said Jo hastily, for she knew he was looking at her. Her bonnet wasn't big enough to hide her face and she feared he might think the joy of it betrayed unmaidenly. Once again Jo flushes and she is very aware of his presence. The sharing of the interior lives happens while trying to interpret the other person's tone and voice and gestures. When Friedrich tells her about the new job and that 
that he can now provide a better home for his nephews. Cho is encouraged by the prospects. Indeed you should. How splendid it will be to have you doing what you like and be able to see you often. And the boys, right Cho, cling to the lads as an excuse for the satisfaction she could not help betraying. Ugh. But we shall not meet often, I fear. This place is at the west. So far away. And Cho left her skirts to their fate. As if it did not matter now what became of her clothes or herself. Mr. Bear could read several languages. But he had not learned how to read woman yet. He flattered himself that he knew Cho pretty well. And was therefore much amazed by the contradictions of voice, face and manner. Which she showed him in a rapid succession that day. For she was in half a dozen different moods in the course of an often an hour. When she met him she looked surprised, so it was impossible to help suspecting that she had come for that express purpose. When he offered her his arm, she took it with a look that filled him with delight. But when he asked if she missed him, she gave such a chilly formal reply that despair fell upon him. On learning his good fortune, she almost clapped her hands. Was the joy all for the boys? Then on hearing his destination, she said, so far away, in a tone of despair that lifted him on to a pinnacle of hope. But the next Next minute she tumbled him down again by observing like one entirely absorbed in the matter. Narrator points out the difficulties of the mute courting, the narration of love, how to verbalize it through nonverbal clues. When they go shopping, Cho is very clumsy and Friedrich starts to see how Cho indeed goes by contradictions. In the store she hides her fright face to a shawl. Does this suit you, Mr. Bear? she asked, turning her back to him and feeling deeply grateful for the chance of hiding her face. I actually always thought this scene was very intimate. It gives me some serious 1995 sense and sensibility vibes. The next moment she rummages the counters like a confirmed bargain hunter. Cho's pattern is to hide vulnerabilities into action, but Cho has gotten into a point where she is ready to let down all her walls. For now the sun seemed to have gone in a suddenly as it came out and the world grew muddy and miserable again and for the first time she discovered that her feet were cold, her head ached and that her heart was full of pain than the latter. Mr. Bear was going away. He only cared for her as a friend. It was all a mistake and the sooner it was over the better. With this idea in her head she held an approaching omnibus with such a haste gesture that the daisies flew out of the pot and were badly damaged. This is where we get into the culmination, the mutual recognition of one another. I beg your pardon. I didn't see the name distinctly. Never mind. I can walk. I'm used to the plodding in the mud, returned Jo, winking hard, because she would have died rather than openly wipe her eyes. Mr. Bear saw the drops on her cheeks, so she turned her head away. The sight seemed to touch him very much, for suddenly stooping down he asked in a tone that meant a great deal. Hot dearest why do you cry liking someone is scary these two have liked each other quite a long time now when you first time bring somebody into your life it is scary because you have to admit to yourself that you are fully open taking the step forward tell you love them is like standing on the edge of a cliff Cho and Friedrich are both standing on the cliff and when Cho opens up, Friedrich tells her that he has already fallen hard. Now if Cho had not been new to this sort of thing, she would have said she wasn't crying, had a cold in her head, told any other feminine fib proper to the occasion. Instead of which, that undignified creature answered with an irresistible sob, because you are going away. Oh my god, that is so good, cried Mr. Bear, managing to clap his hands in spite of the umbrella and the bundles. Cho, I have nothing but much love to give you. I came to see if you could care for it. And I waited to be sure that I was something more than a friend. Am I? Can you make a little place in your heart for old Fritz? He added, all in one breath. Oh yes, said Cho. And he was quite satisfied, for she folded both hands over his and looked up at him with an expression that plainly showed how happy she would be to walk through life beside him, even though she had no better shelter than the old umbrella if he carried it. Friedrich wants to go onto his knees, but they are on the middle of the street covered in a mud, which makes it difficult, so they express their love by looking at each other's, and they no longer care about the surroundings. Cho calls Friedrich by his first name for the first time, which delights him. He says that his sister was the last person calling him Friedrich. Poor man, that was five years ago. Fritz also calls Cho as Cho and not as Miss March anymore. Conversation is now open and tender. Louis' love for Germany continues when Friedrich asks Cho to use the word too 
instead of English U. For those of you who don't speak German, there is a C, which is how you address another person formally. Then there is Du, which is informal and in the 19th century context, much more intimate. In Old English, Du was the more intimate form of you. Critic shows Joe the poem that brought him to her. The poem is caught in the garret and Joe wrote it after Beth's death while feeling very lonely. In most adaptations, Friedrich has come bring Joe her new book. Poem shows that Friedrich has taken the time to follow Joe's career. When Joe asks what kept him away for so long, we find out that he has been looking for a job so that he could provide a home for Joe. This highlights Friedrich's self-reliancy, which is a value that Joe appreciates. Chapter ends into the very famous Not Empty Now line. I am glad you are poor. I could not bear a rich husband, said Joe decidedly, adding in a softer tone. Don't fear poverty. I've known it long enough to lose my dread and be happy working for those I love. And don't call yourself old. Forty is the prime of life. I couldn't help loving you if you were seventy. Professor found that so touching that he would have been glad of his handkerchief. As he couldn't, Joe wiped his eyes for him and said laughing as she took away a bundle or two. I may be strong-minded, but no one can say I am out of my sphere now. I'm bearing burdens. I'm to carry my share, Friedrich, and help to earn the home. Make up your mind to that, or I'll never go. She added, resuming as he tried to reclaim his load. Ah, to give me such hope and courage, and I have nothing to give back but a full heart and these empty hands, cried the professor, quite overcome. Joe never, never would learn to be proper, for when he said that, as they stood upon the steps, she just put both hands into his, whispering tenderly, not empty now, and stooping down, kissed her frantic under the umbrella. Here's another quote from Christine Doyle. While Meg and Joan are the down-to-earth couple, Amy and Laurie are the romantics, the artist. Joe and Friedrich combine the two. One of Friedrich's most compelling qualities is that he combines domestic and romantic heroism. Most 19th century courtship restrained from crossing the line until marriage, but that did not necessarily mean that all relationships lacked passion. Lister mentions that middle to upper middle class couples often did not undertake physical consummation until marriage. However, during unchaperoned courtship they would. Primary sources tend to suggest that during the 19th century, sex became linked to the sentiment of love, especially for women. While women were supposed to be pure by nature, Lister asserts that Victorians joined the sexual and spiritual and the moral in the concept of true love. Here's a quote from little woman fan Kimberly East. In the professor, Cho found a candidate for a kind of marriage she had not considered possible, a union between two people where freedom and partnership intertwine. In such a relationship, she didn't have to sacrifice anything. As a matter of fact, she was able to realize a dream that she otherwise may not have been able to achieve. And in later books, she finds success as an authoress as well as providing a home for boys. Her liberation is complete and no sacrifice has been required of her. Thank you for watching. Check out the episode me and Emily did about Joe's and Friedrich's relationship. Stay well and make good choices. Bye!